it does not say 10 easy steps, but it does say 10 steps, and it doesn't say completing your HIPAA initiative in 10 steps. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and I'm also an attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group. Um, just some house, housekeeping items. If uh, this is the first time you're attending, the slide should be available in the handouts where you can just click on the, that and download it um, in, in your little Citrix window, your, your go to meeting window or go to webinar window, I'm sorry, and uh, you should be able to click on that and download uh, the slides. Also, we take questions as we go. And so uh, Martin Gwynn, our Three Lines Operations Manager, mo monitors the chat and at appropriate times, I'll take a break and I'll ask uh, Martin if, if we have any questions, and then we'll do questions at the end um, for Q and A as well. So, before we get into launching um, your HIP initiative, we need to understand a little bit about, or you need to understand a little bit about what really makes up a comprehensive initiative, uh, because there are partial solutions to the HIPAA problem everywhere, right? And you need to understand, and that's not to say that that buying a partial solution is always a bad thing, but you need to understand what it is that you, you're getting and what you're not getting. So we think components of coverage and comprehensiveness, comprehensiveness include education uh, and understanding of the requirements, step-by-step -step guidance to meet those requirements, and a robust methodology that you can use to uh, repeat over and over certain things that have to be repeated over and over, such as conducting risk assessments. Okay, and then we're definitely going to cover the 10 steps to launch. So what we want to do is provide a foundation understanding of what an organization needs to have in the roadmap in order to survive a HIPAA audit and then the 10 steps to launch. And those things are really related because if you get your uh, initiative launched, you'll probably survive uh, a HIPAA audit, which means you probably will not be found in willful neglect. You may get slapped on the wrist. You, you probably will be missing certain items. But you will be able to make a good faith argument that you haven't stuck your head in the sand and ignored the High Tech Act completely. And then you shouldn't be found in willful neglect because a HIPAA compliance initiative, by definition, really is an evergreen process. It really never ends. Now, I know that most covered entities and business associates don't treat it that way. They treat it as something uh, that you just set and forget. And in the old universe, prior to the High Tech Act, um, maybe that was good enough, uh, not because it met the requirements, because there was no cop on the beat. So HHS wasn't around lurking, and there was no breach notification, uh, and so you know nobody really gave a damn in the industry because nobody ever followed up to check up whether what you were doing was um, correct, comprehensive, etc. So we're going to define a comprehensive initiative. We're going to tell you what's not comprehensive. We're going to tell you key components of comprehensive coverage. We're going to talk about why tracking progress across all your efforts really matters, and a little bit about system thinking, how not to chase your hip or tail or an approach methodology for dealing with your initiative, and then we're going to go and cover the 10 steps to launch. So we want to provide organizations, stakeholders with a sense of how your compliance initiative should be based on full coverage of HIPAA requirements and, of course, how to jumpstart your initiative. So first of all, comprehensive this is going to be defined by uh, adequately addressing the three rules, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. And you have to do that by, by having policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms in place so that you can show visible, demonstrable evidence. And, you know, the question is visible, demonstrable evidence of what? leads to a culture of compliance. Visible, visible demonstrable evidence of results, process results, evidence that you are meeting 
each and every one of the 169 requirements that HHS published in its audit protocol. Okay, so just to go over this again, you need to have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms tracking mechanisms in place at the granularity level of a requirement if you hope to satisfy the requirements. Okay, it's at that level of granularity. So your compliance program must allow you to produce and track VDE for each requirement of the HIPAA rules. So as a practical matter, this means you must have a clear understanding of what each requirement is, obviously, before you uh, can attempt to meet it. You must be able to show VDE for each requirement. If you currently can't show VDE for each, for each requirement, you must at least be able to show HHS a plan that you have put in place for achieving VDE for each requirement, right? So there are no perfect um, audit results, okay? They're gonna find something. If you can make a good faith effort to say that we've launched our HIPAA initiative, which, which we're gonna talk about today in 10 steps, and you can have a plan in place for uh, what you've yet to do, you probably do not get hit with willful neglect, right? Because HHS understands that this is a non-trivial exercise that covered entities and business associates have to continuously go through. Now, items two and three mandate that you have the ability to track progress at the granularity level of a requirement. So it's really all about requirements, right? You know, you're, you're, you're launching an initiative, you should be meeting and checking off the requirements. And you can go out and search for HHS audit protocol or HIPAA audit protocol and you will find the website where they list the requirement. And they list it by rule and I don't understand. They used to have it they used to have it be more interactive where you could click on the privacy rule requirements, security rule requirements, and it, you know, and then now they don't now they don't, or I can't find I can't seem to find that particular version. I just find the version where they list them all. But they're out there. Okay? And this is really no mystery what these audit requirements are. If you see some of these sections, they've just gone through section by section of each part of the rules and listed what you're supposed to do for each section. Okay, so it's not it's not uh, a mystery. It's not hidden. They just go to the rules, and th th those requirements have always been there, right? It, 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 they they can't ask you about anything else but the requirements that are in there. So that part is not hard to understand. So they, they, you will find them based on, you know, uh, 524 is, is, is 164.524 is the privacy rule. All right, all these were privacy rule requirements. Um, then you have the security rule requirements. They're in the 164.300. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm listing, uh, they're really talking about um, the most important administrative uh, requirements, but and then you uh, they really walk through the safeguards, right? So you have the administrative safeguards, the technical safeguards, and the physical safeguards, and of uh, the security rule, and they have requirements for each one of those. And then they have a set of requirements, really small set for breach notification, which really is like a preparation set of requirements. Like, you know, do you, do you have a methodology in place for you know understanding when breach notification should be triggered? Do you have uh, tools and templates and model letters to notify individuals? Do you understand when notification uh, needs to be sent, uh, et cetera? Do you understand the content? So it's basically preparedness are the requirements, um, are the audit, audit protocol requirements for the breach notification rule. Now, all these sections are available in the HIPAA Survival Guide. You can go out and read each one of these and get the full source. Um, and our product, uh, our checklist products walk you through each one of the requirements uh, and give you step-by-step -step guidance, what your policies, policies should be, what your processes should be, and su suggest the tracking mechanisms, and often we'll provide you a tracking me mechanism as in a spreadsheet or something like that that will allow you uh, to track what you've done at, at for uh, what process results you captured at, for that requirement. So here are the numbers. There's 81 requirements for the privacy rule, 78 for the security rule, and 10 
for the breach notification rule, and that's a total of 169. And I'm just going to catch a breath here, Martin, see if there's any questions at this point. Uh, we don't have any questions at this point, but I'll talk for a minute so you get a good catch of your breath. Anyway, um, we're good to go. Okay. Now, I'm going through this part pretty quick, right, because we're going to get to the 10 steps, but I wanted to give you this background uh, material before we do. Now, you can have partial solutions everywhere with respect to HIPAA, and then I call this sort of HIPAA death by a thousand cuts, right, because you're groping around for this partial solution and this point solution, and, you know, you don't really understand what the, the, the big picture is of what you need uh, in order to comply. And we like to talk about the difference between wetware and software because there's a lot of software out there that purports to help you with uh, your HIPAA compliance initiative. And sometimes uh, the EHR vendors were, were, would say, ah, don't worry about HIPAA because, you know, we, we, we take care of that. And one of the things you need to understand is that there are no HIPAA compliant products. That's just marketing speak. The only, the only entities that can be HIPAA compliant are covered entities and business associates because those are the only entities that HIPAA applies to. There are no HIPAA compliant products. There are HIPAA, there are products, software, that can help you comply with some of the requirements. That doesn't make it a HIPAA compliant product. That just makes it software that helps you comply with one or more requirements of HIPAA. So we like to think of wetware is the biological gray matter in a fixed medium suitable for other humans to consume. In other words, know-how as to what comprehensiveness is, what the requirements are, and what you have to do for each requirement, right? So when you're looking at software, you should be thinking, is this just a repository, right, where I put my results, or is it actually helping me understand what to do at a requirement by requirement level, right? And those two things are completely different concepts. Wetware is not software. Right. Wetware is what you need to know in order to comply. It's the big, it's the big picture and the details. It's what you need to know. Wetware is the knowledge transfer vehicle. Vehicle, in other words, it ought to educate you. It ought to show you how to uh, go about complying with these 169 requirements. Focus is on education. Software, generally, generally, is where you store and manage your visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. Now, that's a good thing, and that's a necessary thing, but it's a completely separate thing than what you need to know. So, uh, in our view, compliance software ought to be a lot, should be much more than just a file repository, right? It should help you effectively manage your initiative, because we could do an entire um, webinar, and we probably will, on how to build a repository. And if you have access to, you know, tools like Microsoft SharePoint, or you have access to, Google Apps, it, it is really drop that easy to build a functioning repository that will help you keep track of your initiative. And worst case, you could build a repository just on a network file share, okay? It's just a single place where you have a single version of the truth, that when an auditor comes or, God forbid, you get into a lawsuit, you know where to go find your stuff. So, again, from our perspective, compliance software without wetware is an empty container. Wetware is self-contained. Software requires wetware. So be careful when you're buying solutions to know what it is that you're buying. Now, you can buy partial solutions to help you with risk assessments, incident management, repositories, uh, privacy verifications, incident tracking, network monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. There are partial solutions out there that will help you with all of these things, but you got to understand that most of these are tools that help you deal with certain requirements, okay? And mostly they're tools that help you deal with certain specific technical requirements. They generally do not help you provide uh, by providing the process and the policies that you need to have in place or the training that you need to have in place to meet the requirements, okay? They're generally targeted at specific technical requirements that they're trying to meet, and, you know, the, the, the vendors uh, will use that HIPAA-compliant moniker because it helps them sell software, right? And that's, that's the business that they're in. So 
lots and lots of partial solutions out there. That's okay. There's some great partial solutions. Just understand what it is that you're getting. Okay, so what what would be in the comprehensive components? You need education. Okay, now you need a lot more literacy than you did in the pre-high tech world where you could just use that dumbed down training that everybody had and you had the anecdotes that said, well, if you wouldn't say it in an elevator, don't say it. You know, the world has gotten much more complex than that now. Right? That, that kind of old feel good, happy training is not sufficient. You need a greater level of, of literacy. Literacy with respect to what? The high tech act, the omnibus rule, privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule. And just for clarification, the omnibus rule is really not a separate rule. The omnibus rule was a finalization of privacy rule changes, security rule changes, breach notification rule changes, and changes to the enforcement rule. Uh, and the enforcement rule just has to do with what happens when HHS shows up and there's an audit and how you can appeal and et cetera, et cetera. So it's not something you have to comply with. It's just the process that governs um, how HHS interacts with business associates and covered entities. Okay. You need training regarding business associates. It's a huge topic now under the High Tech Act, right? And it's created a thousand more cooks in the compliance kitchen than used to uh, exist before. You need training around risk assessments, around risk management, around social media, around mobile and HIPAA, around cloud computing, right? Big, big stuff here regarding what you do in the cloud certification, etc. So post High Tech Act, there's definitely a requirement for more compliance literacy. And that's not just for the compliance officer, that's across that's across the board. I think you know that, that there's this misconception that you only had to have a few people that understood the rules and the, the other clinicians just you know got that feel good happy training and that was all that they needed. And uh, you, you know part of what we do you know, at three lines is we're trying to change the thinking around what compliance really is. And compliance is something that you ought to build into your organizational DNA that becomes part of your value proposition of, uh, of um, a part of the quality value that you deliver to patients, right? Part of your business model. So. You're going to address those 169 audit protocol requirements. You're going to do it at a requirement by requirement level. This is what our HIPAA checklist, HIPAA privacy rule checklist does for the privacy rule. You can click on this, uh, by the way, and you can go do a look inside uh, on our store and kind of flip through what's out there. This is this is where, obviously, we're not showing everything here, but this is where we give you the policy. What we're showing here is only the description. We give you the policy you ought to have for this requirement. We give you the processes, uh, suggested processes you should have in place for this requirement, and we we give you suggested uh, tracking mechanisms and often templates and tools and documents and things like that that help you with tracking these requirements. Okay. And for our breach notification, we have a breach notification framework. Breach notification is kind of a, a horse of a different color, but we give you those preparedness things. We have a methodology that, that lets you know when notification is triggered. We have notification content, model letters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So that's how we go about um, our subscription plan goes about helping you meet the, um, the breach notification audit protocol requirements. Now, we're using our stuff, obviously, as an example. This is an example of comprehensiveness. You need, if you're going to go buy a comprehensive solution, you need to ask the question, does it give me step-by-step -step guidance that helps me meet each one of these 169 requirements? And you'll find that by asking that question, you're going to really clarify what it is a vendor is selling and what they're not selling. Okay. So one question with respect to breach notification is, would you know a breach if you saw one? Right. And I'm not really trying to be funny here, right? Are you tracking security incidents the way you should be? Are you prepared for notification? Do you have a methodology in place that helps you, you know, walk through an analytical framework that says, yes, we went through the steps and breach, a breach notification is triggered now. And, and everybody should know that, um, you know, all that changed with the omnibus rule. 
right? So now you have a risk assessment approach. You got this, these steps you got to follow, uh, and there's a presumption of a breach. So the burden is on the business associate, the covered entity, to demonstrate that there's no breach. The presumption is that a breach happened. So I'm going to take another quick pause here, Martin, and see if that. We have uh, no questions as of yet. Wow, I'm really surprised. Um, okay, so step-by-step -step guidance. We talked about that. This is what we uh, provide. This is an example of a checklist item, what we provide for one requirement of the privacy rule. Okay, and you can measure it. We have a scorecard, actually, and we're going to make the scorecards available here soon, free to everybody. So you can go see on a requirement-by-requirement requirement basis, do I have that? It, it, you know, is it completely missing? I don't have it. Do we have it planned? Do we have it, but it's just kind of basic? It's kind of a minimal satisfaction of the requirement? Is it a, we have it and it's functioning, it's been functioning well. We have it and we've, we've, we've not only have it in place, but we've refined it, right? And you can give yourself a scorecard and kind of know where you're at with respect to the requirements. Now, you're not going to find 169 uh, checklist items across uh, our products. And the reason you're not is if you go look at those audit protocol requirements, you'll see that what HHS has done is they repeat the same section like three or four or five times for lots of those requirements. Okay? And they, 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 this section you should do this. And for the same section you should do that. And for the same section you should do that. We just consolidated that so you won't see a one-for-one -one, uh, requirement, but we cover all the, the required sections in the, that 169 requirement protocol list. Okay. Breach notification give you a methodology to help you determine when um, breach uh, uh, is triggered. Here's one way that you can track. Here are the checklist scorecards that we're going to make available. And you give yourself a score and you come out with a rating and it should help you track you know where you're at. It should, it should be a tool for your compliance officer that helps you report to your executive team, what you have in place, what you don't have in place, you know, to an auditor. We've done this, this, and this, uh, and here's the grade that we've given ourselves in these areas. Here's what we got planned, and, and here's what, you know, we really haven't done yet. We don't have the budget for it. Whatever, whatever your story is, you know, it, it, it will help you. But just the fact that you are understand what needs to be done and having the ability to track it is probably enough to get you out of willful neglect land. Okay, so we have a scorecard for the privacy rule, for the security rule, for um, we don't have one for breach notification because that's a, a little different animal. Those ten requirements are are, are pre preparedness, so we don't have the, uh, that. We could and, and probably should uh, develop one for that. We have it for the cloud. We have it for mobile. We have various specialized. Um, scorecards that you can use as well. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about methodology because when we talk about 10 steps to launch, we really are talking about just get started. Do something even if it's wrong type concept. Get started because as you get started, you're going to learn what you really need to do. You can't study this problem to death. It's not that kind of thing. You need to get started in order to better understand the problem in order to solve the problem. We think that uh, that an agile methodology is the best way to do that because most projects fail because of people and process challenges, not because of technical challenges, not because of budget challenges, people and process organizational challenges. Right? And the security rule, especially the security rule, is, it, uh, is really a change management project. It's learning how to effectively manage risk. You're not, you, you you know, the role you, you as an organization are not going to learn how to effectively manage risk in the cyber age that we live in, in a month, in two months, in three months. This is a, an ongoing initiative, right? Because the, the uh, threat landscape and the bad guys keep changing the rules each and every day. Okay? So you've got to get started so you learn more about the problem. Right? And I, what I see happen in the industry is you've got a lot of people that have just stuck their heads in the sand and said, this is far too complex. We don't even want to get started. Well, those people are going to end up in willful neglect land, right? Where you can get started and you can make incremental improvement, improvements and 
you know, everybody should, by now should realize that if the White House can get hacked, if all these government agencies can get hacked, if Target can get hacked, you know, it, 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 you probably are going to get hacked as well. Okay, and even the big boys that are spending a lot of money, but you got to do something, right, to get better at it every day. And there are tools out there that can help you do this. So agile compliance really is just a group of methods that help you iterate through a solution. And I'll let you guys read uh, the rest of that. And the concept is really fail forward fast. Get started, make some mistakes, correct the mistakes, and move on. Okay, now why is this so hard for the healthcare industry to learn? It's because the healthcare industry is run by doctors, and doctors are scientists, and they're taught the scientific method. And this fail forward fast concept is something that's really, really foreign to clinicians. Okay, and so it's a clash, and and you know that's why you've seen a huge resistance from the old, what I like to call the old grumpy docs. Okay, and less and less resistance from younger docs that you know cut their teeth using technology and are using tablets, phones, blah blah blah. They better understand that this fail forward fast is not, you know, is not totally a negative thing because you're exploring brand new territory, right? So, you know, part of that, part of the slowness is uh, a, a cultural thing. So, fail forward fast is the only effective way of solving a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is a problem you don't really understand until you get started. There's no stopping rule. There's really no right or wrong HIPAA implementation. There's just some that are better or worse than others. Every one of every HIPAA implementation is going to be unique and novel because every organization is unique and novel. Okay? And and if you pick an agile approach, it be, it's easier to get started. It's easier to continue doing it. If you try to do this big bang, one shot, set and forget thing, you're bound to fail. And, and you're not going to institute a culture that um, helps reinforce that your initiative should, must be, should be, and must be evergreen. Okay? So it turns out that really, really big, complex problems, not only HIPAA initiatives, but the kinds of problems that we're facing today in many uh, different industries, big problems actually require many small solutions. So you solve the big problem by iterating through many small solutions. It's a message. So, don't form a committee to name a committee to study the problem. Just get started, right? That's the message. Get started. Heavyweight compliance was based on this, um, you know, solving based on a, 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 the concept that we already we knew what all the exactly what the requirements were, and, and we could go out and, and just do it one time, and that was it. Okay, and that's really not the case. That's a the old school formal, it's an, more like an academic model, it's a static model, it's a step one, step two, step three model, right? And the difference is, it's like building a bridge. We understand the physics and the mathematics of building bridges as, as humankind. We built thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bridges. That's a team problem. We understand that. Whereas HIPAA, a HIPAA compliance initiative is an organizational problem. It's got social complexity. It's just a different kind of problem. It's going to be different for every organization that you work in. And given the amount of consolidation and the amount of change that's going on in the healthcare industry today, you might end up working in lots of different organizations over, um, over, over uh, the span of your career. So what's the so what? Well, really quick. And I'm preaching to the choir because if you're in the healthcare industry, you know. The pace of innovation is accelerating. There's competition in time, right? The risk has gone up, you know, a huge movement to electronic health records. We're never going back to paper, although paper is not going to go away for a long time. Everybody's implementing patient portals, right? Uh, with accountable care organizations, pay for performance is a big deal. Moving to ICD-10, the Affordable Care Act, implementing quality measures, implementing pricing transparency, mobile health, and bring your own device. These are things that are all happening to the healthcare industry now, right? All of these things are turning the healthcare industry upside down. Big data and analytics. And essentially, what I like to say is the healthcare industry has gone through 150 years of change in five. Okay, it lagged behind for a long, long time, and now it's it, it, it's accelerating really at a at, at a pace almost like no other industry. Part of it is it it, it had to go 
more ways to catch up. The other part is that there's now a lot of activity, investment, interest, um, you know, from venture capital. There's a lot of innovation that's going to happen in healthcare in, in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So everybody's trying to get on that next uh, innovation curve. And, you know, I like to argue that, you know, unless you're using agile methodology, you're not going to make, you're not going to jump the curve, right? You're going to, you're, you're, you're going to stay on the curve you're on, and you stay on that long enough, you flatline, eventually you go into a death spiral. I mean, the organization won't survive. It'll get eaten by the competition or uh, just swallowed into somebody else's organization. So we don't want to do big bang compliance where you try to define all the requirements, test all the requirements, integrate all the requirements. That's really a really slow feedback loop. And that's the kind of thing where you form a committee, you know, to name a committee to study the problem to death, and you don't ever get started. Okay. Agile compliance is define, test, integrate, and verify. Define, test, integrate, and verify, right? It's a faster feedback loop and it's built on get understand the requirements. You know, you get a big feel. Uh, a feel for the big picture, but get started solving uh, and and uh, meeting requirements. And then you're going to learn by doing that, you're actually going to learn what it takes to actually do an effective, uh, launch an effective HIPAA initiative, what it is to really build a team that knows how to do an effective risk assessment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the process is iterative. Um, and now we're going to talk about 10 steps to launch. So this is another time for questions, if there are any. Yes, there are. Going back just a bit, when will we be posting these scorecards st score that you referred to? That really sounds great. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I, I don't know if we have a, we, we've decided to do it. So we're, we, we are going to do it. We're, we're going to make them available. And you just download them, and we'll have a, a, a user's guide. And we're, um, if you're already part of our mailing list, you, you just get them. If you're not part of our mailing list, for our new, and when I say mailing list, I mean for our newsletter mailing list, we're going to ask you to give us at least your email before you get them. But they'll be free in, uh, in any case. And I, I, you know, we already have uh, we already have uh, the scorecards. We just need to build the offer, I mean, wrap it up, build a little user's guide and kind of uh, what, I, what I would like to do is, is when you, you know, if you give yourself a, a score of uh, two on a particular item, I would like to say, well, you know what, that's really not a very good score here. These are the things that you ought to be looking at to remediate and improve on this part of the scorecard, right? That part that part we haven't placed in our checklist, but that part we got to gather so that we can help you uh, uh, put that into the, the, the form that we're just going to make available for free. Okay. Is it acceptable for a CE to ask their BA for a copy of the BA's risk analysis or risk assessment? Well, if I'm, if I'm the lawyer for the CE, Yes, absolutely. I want I want that. Remember that the business associate agreement is just it's just a contract between two private parties. Okay? Yes, it is a specialized contract. It's a specialized contract because it requires certain statutory language to begin it. But it doesn't prevent, in fact, HHS encourages you to define other aspects of your business relationship with this partner in the same contract, okay? So you're managing one contract instead of 20. It just makes sense from a business perspective. Because it's a contract between two private parties, you can negotiate whatever terms and conditions uh, that you feel you need, right? And generally, everybody knows, those that have the goal make the rules, generally, it's the entity, you know, with the, um, that has the greatest the economic strength in the relationship, right? The big dog versus the little dog, it's the big dog that sort of imposes the terms and conditions on the little dog, right? That's just the way it works. Little dog, if you want our business, this is what you got to agree to. You got to show us your 
policies, processes, procedures. You got to show us what you did for your risk risk assessment. If you're not willing to show us, we're not going to do business with you. Now, if it's a covered entity and you're trying to use Microsoft, um, you know, or Google or Amazon, right? Those are bigger boys. You're the small dog, and they're going to make you sign their business associate agreement, and they're going to because they don't want to. They don't want thousands of different business associate agreements, but the, the thing to remember is you, it, it's a private contract. You, as long as it's not against the law right, or unconscionable, you can negotiate whatever terms and conditions you want in that contract. Um, I'm just going to ask a follow-up question to that. Since this is an evergreen situation, as you as the attorney for the C would accept a, uh, their risk assessment uh, uh, six months, every six months, every year, or to be updated. You know, yeah, given given the nature of the problem and given how the threatscape is literally changing on a daily, if not hour by hour basis, I, I'm, I'm thinking that a risk assessment once a year is the minimum you could actually get away with. You probably should be doing a risk assessment you know, two or three times a year, maybe every quarter, okay? But, uh, yeah, I'm as a minimum, if I'm an attorney for the covered entity, I'm like, no, minimum, once a year, I want to see your results, right? And, and maybe more so, depending on, depending on the business associate, right? There are business associates, and then there are business associates, right? If, if, if uh, a lawyer can be a business associate, Right? And your CPA can be a business associate. Now, if they come on site when they look at PHI, because a business associate is somebody that, that you have to provide your PHI, your protected health information, in order for them to perform the business function that you've hired them to do. But if they're coming on board you know, to your site and looking at it, that's one level of risk. If you're storing uh, your PHI on the cloud, right, where somebody else is controlling that, that's a entirely different level of risk. So, you know, one would require far more safeguards than you might ask your your CPA or your attorney to implement if when they're coming on site. Now, bottom line is you don't see any, you don't really see any business associate light discussions from HHS, but you control the contract. So you could, you could theoretically have, you know, much um, steeper requirements for somebody that's that you're actually giving your PHI to, entrusting your PHI, entrusting that entity with the care of PHI. Yes, you would want certain. You want to want to see certain things, and the results of a risk assessment once a year. I, that's a minimum, and I would want to see their processes, their policies. I want to see all that. Otherwise, otherwise, how can you make a good faith argument later? Okay. Let's say that the, the, the let's say that there's a major breach in a information system controlled by a business associate. All right. Now, first of all, business associates never notify, so it, it's always going to be the covered entity that has to notify, and the covered entity has to eat the cost. So covered entities are getting smart now and asking for indemnification of, of those costs. Okay. And you know what? If you if you get sued now. Everybody knows that, well, everybody should know that a private citizen can't bring a suit under HIPAA, right? The only people who can bring suits under HIPAA is HHS and state attorney generals. But a private citizen can, and a class of private citizens can, bring a suit related to HIPAA that challenges HIPAA, but it's negligence. And the negligence works like this, because, because the HIPAA rules, privacy and security rules say, you need to get satisfactory assurances that your business associates are complying with the rules. Now, if you didn't do anything but just get them to sign a contract, then you're going to lose. You're going to lose because you didn't get satisfactory assurances. In fact, you didn't do anything. All you did was have them sign a contract, right? So when you're asking them for these things, that's how you can justify you know, that yes, we did everything that we could do to try to get satisfactory assurances. Therefore, we were not negligent in this particular situation. I don't know, Martin, if I answered the question, I think I went off on a rant. <laughs> well, no, the, the rant was uh, kind of good because, the you know, the 
satisfactory require the satisfactory requirements part because if you don't look at what yeah we, we've done a risk assessment we're good and you don't ask them what they did and you don't look at their policies and procedures and uh, you don't look at anything else then to your point you're in big trouble but that's all the questions we have for now you did go on a, on a little bit of a rant but it was a good one okay 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 so Satisfactory assurances are, are, are some of the weasel words that you need to be um, aware of that are in, that are got the privacy rule. And, and, um, okay, step one. If I'm an auditor, I'm going to, because these are, these are requirements, I'm going to ask you, okay, who is your named HIPAA privacy officer? If you give me that deer in the headlights look, I know you're dead right from the beginning. Who is your name? HIPAA security officer. Now they can be one and the same, but they got to be designated, and and their job description has to be in their folder, and they have to at least have some clue as to what it means to be a HIPAA privacy officer and a HIPAA security officer. Now, if you're an administrator or compliance officer there where this has been dumped on you, well then you should be asking for more training. You should be asking that your job description is is, is updated because you're the guy. Uh, along with the executive team that's going to be on the hook. So, number one, present some candidates. You know, if you're if you're if you're if you've been charged to sort of figure out this HIPAA stuff, present some candidates with the necessary credentials that uh, that or that will be willing to obtain the necessary credentials via training to the executive team. Name your HIPAA privacy officer. Name your HIPAA security officer. Make sure that um, they get trained appropriately, and then distribute. Uh, don't forget to let your workforce know that you now have a named HIPAA privacy officer and security officer. Who are they? So if somebody in the workforce has a question, they know where to go to, right? That's a drop that easy thing to do. Step one, sticky mark. Step two, disseminate your policies, okay? Now, you know, in our subscription plan, we provide security rule policy, a privacy rule policy breach notification policy, mobile policy, right? Present these policies to the executive team. They can be used out of the box with very little modification. Make the necessary changes uh, based on executive team feedback specific to your organization. There may be some tweaks you want to put in there. You know, let the executive team, an executive team may be with a one doc that manages the whole or two docs that manages the whole show, or it may be, you know, the board, I don't know. Allow them to, you know, review the final policies and then distribute the policies to the entire organization and make sure that people sign it, that they have read and signed so that you have visible demonstrable evidence that you could show an auditor that not only did you have the policies, you distributed the policies and people signed off, right? And that, that sign off should be captured, you know, we don't need more paper, captured electronically as a PDF and, and put it in that workforce member's folder. So you could show an auditor visible demonstrable evidence that, hey, you know, we, we, we have policies, our employees have read them, and they've signed off on them, okay? Uh, and put it in that compliance repository. And I'm just gonna talk about a compliance repository because um, because we can have another webinar exactly and I can show you how it, it's, it's pretty straightforward to build one. Okay, that's not a hard step. now. Okay, if you don't have any policies, well, then that's a harder step. If you don't have any tools, right? Then you got to go develop the policies, right, and, and before you can present them, right? But there are good tool sets out there that will provide you pretty uh, well-written policies. Now, our policies come right out of our checklist, right? Because we believe, uh, going back to the equation, you got to have a policy, you have to have processes, and you have to have tracking mechanism at each requirement level. So we have a policy statement at a requirement by requirement level, okay? And that just becomes, that becomes your security rule policy. It comes right out of our uh, checklist, and that's what you would uh, distribute. So what policies? Well, here's the list, okay? Here's the list. Now, notice the privacy practice is not one that you distribute uh, to your workforce, but it is one that you have to distribute to your patients, and you gotta keep in mind that if you're opening a patient portal on the internet, and if you're doing some sort of telemedicine, your first encounter with that patient could be electronic. 
And if your first encounter is electronic, then that is the point in time when you need to show them your notice privacy practices, let them read to it, click I agree, or you know, document the fact that they didn't agree. But you have to do that on the first encounter, whether it's you know they walk into your practice or whether it's on the internet. Okay, step three, right? Training and awareness. This should be a no-brainer. Training and awareness. Introduce the training program to the executive team, right? Introduce the uh, training uh, training program to the rest of the staff. You know, issue a notice, and then have your key stakeholders, privacy officer, security officer, a, you know, an administrative staff, a clinical staff, some core training team, take the training, take the exams, and give feedback as to how you may want to customize the training for your organization. Okay? And then train everybody. Train the entire workforce, right? If you haven't trained people since the High Tech Act came out, you're in willful neglect because everything has changed, right? In fact, you should do periodic training, and you know, what we provide is is every training mod module that we provide is comes with a, a, a quiz, an answer key. You take a test, right? And what we suggest is, hey, if you don't make 70% or better, you have to take the test again. Now, it's an open book or open video test, right? But it, 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 it's a tracking mechanism. Not only do we train the people on the high tech act on privacy rule and security rule, here's their test results. Okay? So you can show that to an auditor. Look, this is not it's not rocket science. You gotta do this. The rules say you have to do it. All right? So step three, train. Step four, create that compliance repository that we talked about. So that you have a place where you can keep track of all this visible demonstrable evidence that you are gathering. Okay, we already talked about, you know, if you have something like Google Apps or a Wiki or SharePoint, it's really easy enough to do. And here's a really, really rudimentary compliance repository that you could do just on a network share. Create a root folder, call it compliance repository, and under that root folder, obviously if you're doing this on Google Apps or SharePoint, you got all kinds of other features that you can use that come by the way, they're free. They're just inherent in, in those products, right? It's easy to do. But you could just do this on a network file folder if you have to. Have a uh, create a rule directory for policies and procedures, and then you have policies and procedures for the privacy rule, the security rule, the cloud, risk map. All of them are in that in that directory. Under the root directory, create a folder business associates. And then for each business associate, have a subfolder. And that's where you keep all the business associate stuff, the signed contract, the risk assessment results that they gave you, everything related to the business associate, that's where you keep it. You know, do it for <coughs> subcontractors that you may find that aren't uh, business associates. This would be a good place to do it as well. Or if you're a business associate and the sub is also a business associate because you, because you the business associate, have now passed on the PHI to the subcontractor who under the High Tech Act is now a business associate, well then you need to keep track of those. Now, don't be confused. A covered entity only has to keep track of its direct business associates. It doesn't have to keep track of any subcontractors of business associates it deals with. It's the business associate it has to keep track of its subs, okay? Create a, a, a folder under the root for your workforce members. Everybody on your staff and they have their, your, they have their uh, test results, um, any sanctions that were issued against them, etc. This is one place, this is as, as easy as it gets, right, to create a compliance repository. And you can read this, create a folder for security incidents. We, give, we, we provide you a security incident document. Every time there's a security incident, you, you analyze it. If it's a system that contains PHI, you ask some questions. Was it encrypted? If it wasn't encrypted, then you go through your analysis. But you need a place where you gather and keep your security incidents. Now, this presumes that you're actually tracking security incidents, right? Because you're not going to get security incidents to document if you're not tracking them correctly, all right? So, look, this isn't, this isn't rocket science here. Right? It's pretty basic stuff, but it's important basic stuff. But you can show when an auditor comes, hey, we're tracking this stuff, and here's how we track it. Now, I wouldn't have it, obviously, 
on someone's PC, on someone's laptop. I would have it on some network share that gets backed up every night and, and is secure because some of this information you, you don't want other people to read and have access to. <clears throat> All right, now step five is a big one. It's an obvious one. You got to perform a risk assessment. This is foundational. Now, when you see this track equals foundation, track equals foundation, etc., we have over 30, <clears throat> I believe there are 30, like many project plans that come with our subscription that help you get started. And that's what those mean. We have a core track, foundation track, and each one of those has certain uh, mini project plans that you can pick a place and get started. And all I've done here to, to uh, get this 10 steps is to borrow from those plans and say, hey, this, this is what I would do. This is how I would get started. You know you have to, you know you have to conduct a risk assessment, all right? Now, I, I, you know, all the other stuff, that the first four steps, they're just so basic that I, I can't even see why you would do a risk assessment because you're going to be in willful neglect if you haven't done those four, all right? That, those are just no-brainers. But you know you've got to conduct a risk assessment uh, or you're going to get dinged, all right? And then... You know, go through the process. Make sure you get approval, budget, etc., and then actually conduct conduct it. Go through the seven steps: gather and capture inventory, identify threats and vulnerabilities, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, we are going to have a, a for our subscribers. Uh, okay, we're going to have an, uh, in October the four. Uh, what is it, Martin? It's the seventh, fourteenth, twenty-one, and twenty twenty-first and twenty-eighth. Right? We're going to have a how to survive a HIPAA audit where we go through all 169 requirements. And that training is free to our uh, subscribers. It's going to be two hours, it's going to be eight hours of, of training, like going to a, a webinar where we just go, we help you launch your initiative. We will, we will walk you through it, and we will specifically walk you through these seven steps. Now, th these seven steps come right out of our checklist. We, you know, gather uh, and capture the inventory, identify threats and vulnerabilities. We give you step-by-step -step coverage in our security rule checklist, but we're also going to walk our subscribers through a how-to, uh, a pretty deep how-to session on how to conduct their first uh, risk assessment or in, in to improve uh, the risk assessments that they're already doing. Okay, step six. Make sure that you have the appropriate business associate contracts in place with all your business associates and make sure that you've gotten satisfactory assurances, okay? And we talked about what that means and why that's important. So, Martin, I'm, we're, we're like at step six. I'm, I'm going to take another break here, have a sip of coffee, and see if there's any questions. I think Martin went to sleep. Martin, you there? No, I had, I had you turned off. Um, uh, there are a couple questions, but there was a remark I wanted to share with the group. That was a very great rant. So your rant was enjoyed. It was very informative. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. As far as questions go, uh, I have several policies in place and posted on our intranet for everyone to read but I've never asked them to read, sign, and save in their HR folder. Is that what you are suggesting, or is there a basic one stating that they know where the policies are? Just need, no. a, little, just need a little clarification. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, no, I, I, I would say just posting it on the Internet. Intranets are black holes, right, for organizations, right, Dave? We've all been part of organizations, most of us, that have intranets that we never bother paying any attention to, right? Just stuff gets dumped out there. I uh, I don't think that's enough. I, I think you, you want a record that they read, they read it, and they sign it. It's a great place, really. It's a great place to build your repository, you know, with the right with the right uh, security, uh, to keep the single version of the truth, to keep the visible demonstrable evidence uh, that you're tracking. Uh, but I would have those... Uh, policies printed out. I would have a signature line. Uh, I, I would make sure that they sign each one of those policies, uh, scan them back in as a PDF, and store it in their folder. Okay. What is the difference between a risk assessment and a security risk analysis? It's just confusing terms that the industry is using to say the 
the damn same same damn thing. Okay, it's a risk analysis and a risk assessment, and a security risk assessment. It's all the same thing. Okay, it's all it all comes out of administrative safeguard one of the HIPAA security rule, and it's the first implementation, the first required implementation specification of that standard. Okay, uh, that's that's a risk assessment. Sometimes it's called the risk analysis, but that's where you go and that's where you find the definition. That's what it, that's what it is. And that's uh, that this gather the inventory. That process we just described is a process that we modified from looking at the NIST documents because although the NIST documents are good as reference, what NIST does because they're a government agency, they're never going to tell you how to comply. They're never going to give you the how to because then they would be held to that, right? So what NIST does is they play 20 questions. So for this requirement, here's the 20 or 30 questions that you should consider. For this requirement, here's the next 20 or 30. And by you know the third requirement, you're pulling your hair out because this isn't helping you. I don't, I don't need more questions. I need answers, right? And so um, uh, so we, we modified that and we provided, we took their methodology, which was a solid methodology that they, they spent millions uh, developing and we modified it and we provide the how-to on a risk assessment. We essentially took their risk assessment methodology and language and added the how-to and provided uh, spreadsheets and templates and tools that help you actually get through that first, second, third risk assessment. Okay. Does any part of the risk assessment address privacy requirements? Well, you know, they all do, really. The whole thing is about privacy. I mean, the whole thing is about privacy. The whole thing is about, uh, I'll give you an example. Unless there's a violation of the privacy rule, there can be no breach, right? Now, everybody associates associates breach and breach notification with the security rule, and you got to encrypt and you got to do all these things. To, that's a technical thing, right? But the first question of the analytical framework for breach notification is, was there a violation of the privacy rule? It's all about privacy. If there is no violation of the privacy rule, there's no breach by definition. Now, that begs the question, how do you go about figuring out whether there's been a violation of the privacy rule? Well, you start in general rule 164.502 and you walk through those 12 or 14 rules in the general rule and that's how you figure it out. Whether or not whether or not it was violated, you know, you ought to have a process in place, and our breach notification framework gives you that process. Because step one is go figure out if there was a violation of the privacy rule. No violation of the privacy rule, no breach. So the, the it's all about privacy. Um, that's all we have at this time. Okay. So here are just some other issues about business associates. What if you have an international business associate? Well, you know what? If you're in India, uh, if you're an Indian company and you're in New Delhi and you're doing medical transcription or reading, um, you know, uh, lab results or whatever it is you're doing on behalf of a covered entity or uh, another business associate, you don't, you don't have to comply with U.S. law. But, and this is a pretty big but. In your contract, you as the business associate or covered entity that's given that Indian company protected health information of your U.S. patients better get satisfactory assurances and better have them sign a business associate contract because even though they don't have to comply with U.S. law, they do have to comply with the contract because you can sue them on the contract if they don't do the right thing. All right? So that's how you deal with international uh, business associates. Uh, and there are other things here around business associates that I, I, I will um, just let you read, but you, 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 it's a big concept, right? It, it, it's a huge concept, and this is why you get started because, you know, you, you could spend six months just trying to satisfy the business associate track. That probably wouldn't make sense because it's probably preferable to get the basic things in place, give yourself a score of two or three, and then come back and get better at it over time, okay? Step seven, you can't manage, I mean, you can't do anything with a breach notification if you don't have a system in place for tracking and reporting incidents, right? So if I am an auditor and I ask 
I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to say this. Look, I want to talk to the executive team. I want to talk to your HIPAA privacy officers, security, but I'm going to ask some questions of your staff. And one of the questions I'm going to ask of your staff is, do you know who the HIPAA privacy officer is? And I guarantee you, if you go to the, your doctor, the next time you go to the doctor, if you ask them who's your HIPAA privacy officer, you're going to get that deer in the headlights look. Almost certainly, right? Maybe not 100% now because some 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 covered entities are, are are snapping too, right? But I would follow that up with and say, okay, nurse, if you uh, see a HIPAA violation or yourself commit a HIPAA violation, do you know who to report it to? How, how, how do you go about reporting that security incident? What do you do, right? And if she or he says, well, you know, I don't know, or, you know, well, we, we, I contact Janie. She's our HIPAA person, right? And then I, then I would ask Janie, well, what do you do with that security incident, right? Do you document each incident? I mean, how do you resolve that? So what we recommend is, look, a security incident is not equivalent to a breach. An attempted breach is a security incident. So you got to log them all, okay? And you, have, and you have to have a way of reporting. And now we give you tools, we give you a spreadsheet with various columns and say, look, if you don't have any other tool, use this. Just capture the incident. Now, one of the questions is in our breach notification framework, hey, question number one, does this incident involve an information system and it has PHI in it? Yep, oh, okay, well then we need to do a breach notification analysis. You know, then you start. Was there a violation of the privacy rule? Uh, yes or no, right? Or, you know, and this is part one of the question, was there a violation of the privacy rule of unsecured protected health information? Because if you encrypt according to the protocol, there, there can't be a breach by definition. So if that particular system where the alleged incident happened is encrypted according to the NIST protocols that were recommended by the HHS secretary, you're done. What you say is tempted breach, information system ABC, all PHI encrypted, you, sign, you, you mark the date, you sign it, you're done. You don't have to do any more breach notification uh, uh, analysis because, you know, because encryption is the ultimate safe harbor. But you got to have a place where you're rigorously tracking security incidents, or you're going to be in willful neglect land. It's just a basic, basic requirement. <laughs> okay, these are more step eight. These are more arcane problem or issues um, or mini project plans, but they're going to become increasingly more important because I guarantee you that almost no one has is doing this at the level of rigor that they should because everybody thought that the high tech act had everything to do with the security rule and it did actually but the rules are a coherent set of regulations right and that question about the risk assessment and privacy that's really a good question because it's really all about privacy that we're trying to protect security rule is just technical ways that we that we protect privacy okay <laughs> so how are you tracking your notice of, uh, uh, of privacy practices? We talked about this. You have to do it for walk-ins. You have to do it for electronics. You have to update the omnibus, uh, the omnibus rule that came out in September 2013 mandated that you update your notice of privacy practices. So if you haven't updated your notice of privacy practices after uh, like around October, I think it was September, October. I don't remember now. I think, no, I think it was March 2013. It said, these are material changes to the law. You have to modify your notice of privacy practice. Okay. Now, you should also have what we call the patient's bill of rights are sections of the privacy rule between 164.20 that has to do with the notice of privacy practices to 164.28. And that has to do with access to PHI, amendments to PHI. So what process do you have in place if I as a patient say, you know what? I want all my PHI. Now, do you think you can tell me, ah, forget about it. We're not going to give it to you. No, you can't tell me that. In fact, you got to give it to me within 30 days. And if you can't give it to me within 30 days, 
you have to give me a, re a written reason why you can't give it to me in 30 days. And then in that written reason why, you have to tell me when you are going to give it to me. Okay? And within reason, you have to give it to me in a format that I want. I want it all in PDF. Okay? Now, Signet, you know, many moons now, seven or eight years ago, we got fined $4.3 million. It was after the High Tech Act, $4.3 million. At the time, I think it was the largest fine because they just simply refused to give PHI to like 20 patients. I guarantee you, now I don't know if, if, if how many of you know this, but if, if, if you uh, file a complaint with, if a patient files a complaint with HHS and on the face of that complaint, HHS can, can determine that these facts show potential willful neglect, they have to do an audit investigation, it's mandatory, okay? And I guarantee you that if you have patients complaining, saying they didn't get access to their PHI, that's going to trigger an audit. So that will trigger an audit faster than just a random selection, right, of, of being audited. That's going to be really, really small probability. The, the probability that some patient complains or that you have a breach is going to be much higher. So I would start asking questions as to who is control, who, what is your process for, for when a patient asks access for, to PHI? What's your process when they ask to amend the PHI? What's your process when they ask for an accounting for disclosures? Okay. <clears throat> and then we go through and we provide you, and these come out of our uh, many project plans and they come out of our uh, checklist, what the process is, the suggested processes you should put in place for, for example, access to PHI. <clears throat> okay. And then for amending PHI. And the rules say you have to have a designated individual, they should be trained, that designated individual should be signing off when they provide um, the um, access to the PHI. When they amend PHI, they should be signing off, communicating with the patient, and then you should store all that communications with the patients regarding compliance in the patient's folder in your compliance repository, right, so that you can produce it uh, later on. So, here are the 10 steps. You guys can read the specifics, but I guarantee you that if you did these 10 steps, it's not like you're going to pass an audit, like this is all everything you have to do. It's clearly not, but you're probably, almost certainly not going to be found in willful neglect. You're almost certainly going to avoid um, the largest penalties, okay? So what we've gone through here is not an exhaustive list of our agile methodologies, tracks, chunks, etc. We have about 30 of them that we provide our subscribers. And I'll quickly go through our, our shameless plug here. You can get all 26 or 27 of our products. So I think if you bought them individually, it's like a $4,000 you would have to spend. You get them all for $795 a year. The renewal year is optional. If you want to keep getting new products and updates to products, access to our free webinars for subscribers, then it's $4.95 per year. But for that $7.95, you get all our training products, all our model policies, all our checklists, our audit preparation tools, just, just about everything we get. You can go out to our store and, and see the products, okay? So the renewal, you get any new products, you get updates to existing products. This is just, we're saying it's free. It's really part of your renewal costs. And all of these webinars that we do are recorded and put out there so they become a library uh, for our subscribers to uh, to use and have access to over time. So we, we like to feel like we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients, that we provide educational products that you can execute on starting on day one, okay, so you can get started ASAP. These are agile compliance products. Doesn't matter if you're a business associate or covered entity, you can use them. It's wetware and accept no substitutes. And at this point, we will take more QA if there is any. We have one question, uh, and um, uh, well, actually, this is uh, something else too. The slides uh, out for everybody out there are in the handout section of your Go to Webinar panel, and it's 10 steps to launch uh, PDF, so you can grab that there. Uh, for step eight, uh, how do these requirements? Uh, uh, 
apply to the BAs, the Patients' Bill of Rights? Uh, that's a great question. There are, there are some um, instances where, uh, where if it's the BA that has control of the, PA, of the PHI, um, then it's the BA that needs to uh, uh, provide the PHI to the patient, either as a request from the patient or as a request from the covered entity that came from the patient. Now, uh, I got to tell you, if if like I'm an EHR vendor and I'm representing the business associate, so I'm the lawyer in this hypothetical for the business associate, and I'm an EHR vendor, I'm going to put in the contract, you know what, we provide you all the tools and everything you need to get the PHI to your patients, but we are not we are not the front line for providing PHI to your patients. You, the covered entity, have to provide that. I would put that in the contract, right? And I would try to put that in every BA contract that I could if I was the lawyer for the business association. But yes, there are, there are, if you control that PHI, then you're on the hook. You're potentially on the hook. Um, would a patient really ever request PHI from a BA? Wouldn't it always come from the CE? Well, I, you know, I don't know, right? The patient could know who your EHR vendor is, right? And, you know, they, they could say, you know, they, they could request it, right? There's no rule that says a patient can't, okay? So what are you going to do? Just rely on the fact that you think, I mean, I agree with the premise that most of the time the patient is going to ask, uh, the business associate, but I mean the covered entity, but let's say you didn't put that in the contract. There's nothing stopping the covered entity that says, okay, business associate, you control this PHI, provide it to the patient. Okay, that would just be, from a business associate's perspective, that would be the same administrative headache as if the patient had asked them directly. Um, that's all the questions we have. Well, great. Thank you for listening, and uh, it's the third Thursday of every month that we do, we do it. We make the announcements of uh, what's going to be in our uh, webinar in our newsletter, so if you haven't signed up, uh, please sign up. Thank you.